Hello and welcome to Spectator TV, I'm James Heal. Coming up on today's show... Katie Balls and Alex Massey discuss the resignation of Nicola Sturgeon. She says after eight years in the job, she no longer has the will to keep on going. We'll be discussing that and the likely contenders to succeed her. Is China just a paper dragon? Brian Appleyard writes in this week's magazine why Chinese science isn't all it's cracked up to be. He'll be joining me and Cindy Yu to discuss this further. Bird? Plane? Spy balloon? Andrew Stutterford writes in this week's magazine about America's strange relationship with the UFOs. He'll be discussing this and the national security implications of recent cases with Elrish Colby, an expert in the subject. And finally, Kate Andrews writes in this week's magazine about the toxic cult of self-love. But is journaling and waking up at 3am to shout at yourself in the mirror really all that bad? She'll be joining me to discuss on the programme. Before we get going, if you do enjoy Spectator TV, then subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and you'll never miss another episode. Now, after Sturgeon, what's the future for Scotland and the Union? In this week's magazine, Katie Balls, Spectator's political editor, looks at the question of the next Scottish First Minister. I'm joined now to discuss this piece with Katie and the Scotland editor, Spectator, Alex Massey as well. Katie, why is this decision and why now? That's a good question, James. Well, good two questions, in fact. Um, I think if we're if we're looking at you know what are the factors that led Nicola Sturgeon to, I think take the majority by surprise this week, particularly the Spectator, as we tried to put one cover to bed and had to tear up the whole thing and start again with two hours to go. Um, uh, there's so many factors here, and I think it's quite hard to work out right now and perhaps will come clear in the coming days what the final straw was but we know Nicola Sturgeon has uh, ultimately seen her grip on her party loosen in recent months we know she's um, under pressure on several fronts uh, I think clearly on independence um, her party uh, will begin to say particularly those who are the most passionate about the primary aim of the Scottish National Party and um, saying when are we going to get this referendum what is the route um, obviously last year Nicola Sturgeon called that referendum that she didn't have the power to have, ended up in a court battle, found that she couldn't do it. And yes, it did lead um, some SNP politicians to be able to say, once again, Westminster is frustrating the will of the people. It also just exposed how few options she had when it comes to actually making a referendum happen. And then she went from that to then saying, well, it's fine because we're going to make the general election a de facto referendum. Now, there were some SNP MPs in Westminster who have said, well, are we really? Because cost of living was such a big issue. Is this the right messaging um are we potentially be sacrificial lambs on this if we, if we say it's all about this when we were talking about something else um and there was a going to be a conference coming up where this would have to be decided um in her speech nick the uh, sturgeon reference is saying I can't go to this conference if I'm not sure I'm going to see it all the way through. Now, Nicola Sturgeon was very keen to talk about the personal toll being in a frontline politics role has had. Um, there are, I think, more than a few parallels with Jacinda Ardern, um, New Zealand Premier, who recently resigned herself. But I have to say, when you speak to you know uh, figures within the SNP, but also Scottish politics and Westminster, and um, we think it's more to do with the other pressures facing her. Right. Because away from independence, we also had obviously the row over the gender recognition bill, um, the fact that Nicola Sturgeon pushed that forward, um, divisive within her party. Um, then you had Rishi Sunak block it. Um, Nicola Sturgeon and I said, well, this is ultimately a Tory prime minister waging a culture war. But it turns out more Scots than not seem to agree with Rishi Sunak rather than Nicola Sturgeon. The polling suggests that was backed. And then I think when that that then became a scandal involving rapists uh, in uh, female prisons in Scotland. It clearly um, escalated further and that was really difficult for her. You also have questions about a loan um, involving her husband. Uh, you have an uh, ongoing situation with Alex Salmond, um, which has upset some in the SNP party. Um, and then you have scandal of the ferry and you have the domestic record. And that all comes together and I think you just have a prime... Um, you have a first minister who was under a lot of pressure. And when you look at that Jacinda Ardern comparison, um, was this a leader who, you know, supremely popular, lots of politicians looked on with envy, um, who just decided it was all too much? Or was it a leader who effectively was just going before things got a lot worse for both themselves and their party, and perhaps they were pushed? Alex, in this week's magazine, Katie talks about how Nicola Sturgeon's domestic record was uh, perhaps catching up with her. Um, you write in The Times today talking about how you know she didn't deliver on health or education compared to the aspirations she had. Is there a sense perhaps that she'd frankly run out of road? <laughs> 
Yes, but that is much more, as Katie says, I think, um, running out of road on the constitutional question rather than uh, her domestic agenda. I mean, it's true that Nicola Sturgeon once said, you know, I want to be judged on my record on education, but that was always, it struck me as a, as a profoundly cynical type of uh, declaration because a politician who says they want to be judged on a, an issue where they're unlikely to make significant progress in the short term is one who's saying that knowing uh, secure in the knowledge that they won't be uh, judged on their record by their most devoted supporters, you know, because the you know the the SNP uh, has a lot of voters who, for instance, say, you know, say if you're a teacher um, and you vote SNP, if you were to judge them purely on their record on education, you, you know, they might not vote SNP, but they believe in independence, and that is the more important thing. Um, and if you believe in independence, well, where else can you go, really, if you consider this to be the most important uh, subject in Scottish politics? Um, so the, the SNP has a very, very high floor uh, for its support, if you like. Um, and the you know, Sturgeon is able to capitalise on that. So the so questions about education or drugs or even even the gender stuff doesn't really necessarily have that, that much of an impact. Um, so the problem for her was running out of road on the Constitution. And I think it's very important to note that it isn't the British government and it isn't the Supreme Court that is effectively blocking a second re independence referendum. It's the people of Scotland who are doing so. If it was clear that 60, 65, 70 percent of, of voters in Scotland demanded a referendum. I think it would be almost impossible for there not to be one. Um, the moral and political case for that would be pretty much unanswerable, as of course was the case in 2011 when the SNP won a majority in the Scottish Parliament and everybody agreed, including the political parties who didn't want there to be a referendum, that it was reasonable for there to be one. And it's that test of reasonableness that at present the SNP struggles to pass. Um, now, in the longer term, you can envisage circumstances in which Scottish voters begin to think it is more reasonable to have a referendum than not. But at present, uh, that is not where they are. And so it's the people who are blocking the road to a referendum. And so you have this sort of bitterly ironic situation in which it is plausible or possible to argue that it might be easier for the SNP to win a, a referendum on independence than it is for them to get a referendum on independence. And so, you know, th that is the, 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 if you like, the strategic problem Nicola Sturgeon faced um, and one that she was unable to, to answer, frankly. You know, she has spent the last six years promising every six months uh, that there would be another push for independence, marching her troops up to the top of the mountain, only to then march them back down. And after a while, even, even the credulous ones begin to answer, you know, begin to ask, well, you know, what are we doing here? Why aren't we actually making any real progress? Um, uh, and that is the, the, the problem. And, and that's the one that any new leader, any successor to Nicola Sturgeon is going to have to confront and find an answer. Um, but if Nicola Sturgeon couldn't find an answer to this problem, you do have to wonder how well equipped any of her potential successors will be to find an answer to the same issues that, that stymied Nicola Sturgeon. Alex mentions the question there of succession. Katie, who are the likely candidates? So I think it is testament to how much space Nicola Sturgeon has occupied in politics that there isn't really an obvious successor. So there's lots of, you know, you have Bookie's favourites, you have some, but lots of people saying, you know, in the case of John Swinney, are they interested in running? Um, but there's not an obvious heir apparent. Um, and therefore, when I think you're looking at potential runners and riders, so for example, the, the bookie's favourite when this was all announced was Angus Robertson, um, who of course used to be an MP before he lost his seat to Douglas Ross, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, now an MSP. Um, he, when he was in Parliament, he was the SNP Westminster leader. Um, I think he's a you know pro-EU Scottish nationalist, uh, confident speaker, um, that is seen as you know, someone who would be a relatively safe pair of hands. Then you have Kate Forbes. I think there's quite a lot of excited chatter about Kate Forbes. Has long been a rising star within the SNP um, in her role as finance minister. Um, she has been on maternity leave lately. Um, and she is someone who I think is, is seen as someone who could probably uh, continue a lot of what Nicola Sturgeon did, um, in the sense she was a close ally, but would be different in some ways. And there's one thing already with uh, Kate Forbes, which is she is a committed Christian. So you're already hearing some say, well, 
how would that impact her if she was to be uh, the leader of the SNP? Because we know that uh, the party has taken you know, a really progressive stance on lots of social issues. And we talk about the gender recognition bill, but also um, would you have a Tim Farron problem when you have uh, you know, a leader who uh, leads a party uh, which is pretty liberal in its values socially, um, but yet in every interview it comes back to, what are your personal views, however, on gay marriage? What are your personal views um, on abortion? And it makes it really hard to move past. And I think it's perhaps a sign of the way the race is going that people are already saying that um, suggests that she is perhaps one to beat. Um, and then I, you can go through, you know, there's there's more, uh, you know, candidates. Um, for example, Joanna Cherry's name will often come up with Scottish Tories. But I think, A, she obviously isn't um, in currently in a position to um, go for it. And also she did clash with many over the gender recognition bill. Um, you have the ultimately the SNP health secretary. Uh, you end up in a situation where I think we can talk about names, but as of yet, no one is yet to declare. So there's a case of who wants the role um, and then and then will they um, get the support? Um, Alex, Katie raises a really interesting question there, which is there's lots of names we can talk about, but actually, if you look at the history of the SNP, there's not really a history of contested elections. They're typically won by two thirds of the vote by one clear favourite. Do you think we're going to have a really kind of contested election? And second of all, do you think we're going to see the constitutional question and the differences in approach about how to approach um, uh, independence rear its head and really dominate? What do you think are going to be the key issues in any race should one occur? Well, quite a lot will, I think, depend on the terms and conditions, the rules that are and the timetable that is set for an election. Um, there is obviously certain uh, there's a, there's an argument in favour of getting it done quickly. Um, if that were to happen uh, over the next month or so, then I think one would have to presume that would favour any candidate that begins with a higher than normal uh, rate of name recognition. So you'd be talking about a John Swinney or an Angus Robertson, maybe a Kate Forbes. Uh, if it's a longer, more protracted process, then that obviously provides greater opportunity for less well-known names, uh, somebody such, such as Neil Gray, uh, junior minister in, uh, at Holyrood, um, or some other you know, candidate who is effectively unknown to the general public. Um, and that, again, you know, just to sort of reiterate some of the problems and so on, there's been a lack of clear succession planning from Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, and it is impossible to imagine how that any of her successors can have quite the same uh, breadth and depth of connection to the average or typical Scottish voter as Nicola Sturgeon had. Um, and yes, I would expect that because this is a contest to, that will be decided by party members, uh, not the general public, the, the approach to the constitutional question, which is, after all, the, the SNP's only non-negotiable policy, its foundational reason for existence, is going to dominate. And therefore, um, there is an incentive in certain respects for candidates to tell the party what it wants to hear, um, which isn't necessarily the same as what the party can deliver. And so the hoops that you have to jump through to win the leadership election are hoops that may end up being traps for you once you're actually in office yourself, um, because you will have made commitments that it is not necessarily obvious you are in a position to honour. And so I think they have to be very wary of that. Um, and, you, you know, but the SNP is such a dominant party in Scotland that, you know, you don't act, you, you can win elections um, without having to seek to persuade anyone who isn't already an SNP committed SNP supporter. Um, you don't actually have to reach across political divides. You don't have to have a, a big tent, a big Scotland um, uh, type approach. You can just win an election by appealing to the SNP rank and file and its core support. Um, but that doesn't help you get to the 50% threshold that one day you need for independence. Um, and so the SNP is trapped in this situation where it is relatively easy for them to continue to dominate Scottish politics with 40% of the vote, 45% of the vote. But getting that, you know, those final few percentage points of support, which is what they require in the longer term, becomes very much more difficult. And what works for the base, the party membership, may not be what is required 
for the general public um, that you need to appeal to in uh, any putative independence referendum. Um, but again, the road to that referendum is not clear. And I don't really see how any new leader can take a, an approach that is obviously different from Nicola Sturgeon, while at the same time wanting to, sort of, if you like, honour her, uh, her memory. Um, uh, and so the SNP is at a, a very difficult position, I think, actually, you know, um, a, a genuine set of choices that have to be made Made, but all of them are fairly speculative and none of them carry with any guarantee or even possibly any likelihood of, of paying off in the short to medium term. Alex, I mean, Nicola Sturgeon may have failed to get independence, but she came top of every single Westminster and Hollywood election for the best part of a decade. What do you think her legacy is likely to be? Well, uh, I suppose um, taking a longer term view, if say in 10 years time, uh, Scotland has become an independent state, then I think Nicola Sturgeon, Sturgeon's legacy would be that of, if you like, the, the founding mother who made that possible in many respects, along with obviously Alex Salmond. Um, uh, if, however, that doesn't happen, then I think her legacy is uh, very much diminished um, because, you know, you can't point to that many um, notable achievements in areas of default responsibility. There are a couple. I think the setting up of a new social security service um, in Scotland and the creation of a, a dedicated child benefit payment, Scottish child payment, which costs around £500 million pounds a year um, and is paid to, to poorer families. I think that, you know, but well, when you move beyond that to, to areas like health and education, drugs, transport, the record is very much more mixed. Um, so at a core fundamental level, perhaps, the um, the true legacy is that independence as a as a uh, as a possibility as a concept has been thoroughly normalised. Um, it is if it was ever unthinkable, it no longer is. It's entirely thinkable, um, and so that is then the basis upon which all future Scottish politics will be based uh, for the foreseeable future. A fascinating question, one which we will continue to discuss on Spectator TV. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Katie. Now, Flights of Fancy, how UFOs captured the imagination of America and the world. Uh, in this week's magazine, Andrew Stutterford talks about how the recent uh, Chinese spy balloons are part of a wider phenomena uh, dating back to the 19th century. Uh, Andrew, first of all, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Uh, talk us through all the sort of suspected UFO sightings uh, since this trend first began and how they sort of occur in sort of trends is called, you call them flaps, and that's the name for them. Talk us about this piece and how uh, UFOs became such a huge uh, American cultural phenomenon. Certainly. Uh, I mean, UFO, UFO, UFOs um, have, have been around for a long time. Uh, you, you, there are, you know, there are cases uh, in the Middle Ages uh, and before that. Um, but what changed, what changed things uh, was uh, mass communication. And uh, the first uh, UFO flap, although they, they didn't use the term then, um, was uh, in the in the eighteen nineties uh, in um, California uh, when people saw uh, various forms of allegedly saw uh, various forms of uh, uh, of um, airships, some with wings, great size, some containing Martians. Uh, it's not clear that anyone ever saw anything, uh, even, even a hallucination. Um, but the stories spread, and, uh, and and that was really a proto flap, if you like. Um, it was forgotten, um, but what you saw, what you, what you saw uh, in the in the years that followed was uh, what I think of as, as as an intellectual softening up for the idea that UFOs might be real, and that came from two 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 sides, which sort of in some ways merged. The first was that you you saw um, uh, science moving forward. Uh, you, you had uh, Goddard in the US uh, was actually um, shooting off rockets, li liquid fuel uh, rockets in, 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 I think, 1926, if I remember, was the first one. And uh, and, then, and there were other people, the Russians, had, I don't, they hadn't set anything off at that point, but they were working on, on it. Uh, and then, of course, the Germans in the early 30s. And um, so there was the scientific possibility of space travels was becoming real. Um, at the same time, the fictional uh, parameters were 
had expanded. I think partly because of the way the science was. Again, you can go back a long, long, long time to find references to beings on on other planets. Um, but uh, then you had H.G. Wells with the uh, the War of the Worlds, and um, but in the twenty and you you did see sort of magazines which had science fiction stories in, in the Edwardian era and a bit later. But in the tw- but in the twenties you 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 began to see particularly in the U.S. Uh, pulp uh, sci-fi, which became um, the quality went up and up and up. But all the people like Asimov and so on, they they all began there. And um, so, come World War II, you have um, again leaps uh, forward in science. There were odd reports of so-called Foo Fighters, which were uh, reported by almost all the competent airmen on, on not all competent but, uh, airmen from all sides. These strange balls of light, um, and that went made it to Time magazine. But the real moment was um, in uh, 1947 when uh, Kenneth Arnold, uh, who was a businessman, he was taking his plane uh, past Mount Rainier in uh, Washington state, and he saw, quotes, uh, nine nine uh, bright objects. And uh, when he came back uh, to, to the base, he, he mentioned that he'd seen that. And uh, he said, there's a lot of debate over what he actually said, but he, 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 he probably said they skipped across like saucers. And the phrase saucer caught the imagination. He 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 probably never described them as a, a saucer shape. Um, but that's what caught the imagination. And again, you had mass media, and um within 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 days, uh, everyone was talking about either flying discs or flying saucers, and um the uh, the, the the Roswell crash, uh, which wasn't really what it was described as, uh, that followed a couple of weeks later. But all over the country, there were sightings of uh, alleged sightings of UFOs, and you also that in turn got the media interested. The media report, you know, uh, uh, UFO stories sold very well, but then the fictional side of, uh, also got interested, and it wasn't just. There was the sci-fi, of course, which which carried on and was carrying on. But you also got, as the decade went on, uh, you also got Hollywood interested. So you had basically a fusion on the one side. You had a fusion between science and or, or, or perceptions of science and fiction. And on the other side, you had all these stories floating around, being promoted by the media. Those stories in turn, in turn were then reflected by the media and then reflected back and they shaped what people saw. And so the UFO narrative began. That's fascinating. And joining us is uh, Elrich Colby. Uh, and uh, Andrew in his piece writes that, uh, you know, the sensors that scan America's skies have been recalibrated to catch slow moving items, uh, such as these suspicious Chinese balloon. Um, Elrich, explain to us why these items were shot down. There were four items, we believe. And um, just about the context of why the American military is involved with uh, UFOs and the real life threats we face well, I'll, I'll defer to Andrew on, uh, and others on on the sort of UFO phenomenon. For those who are interested, I mean, there's his very good piece coming out in The Spectator, but uh, my friend Tom Rogan wrote a piece in The Washington Examiner kind of looking at the issue. I'd, I'd commend to people's attention. I thought very uh, kind of thoughtful and empirical. Um, just in terms of the the Chinese balloon and, and the three additional balloons that, that or objects, I should say, that have been downed. I mean, the initial balloon, a very large Chinese surveillance balloon that transited the United States and Canada. That was clearly a Chinese surveillance balloon. Three additional objects have been identified. Uh, what's ha- what appears to have happened, listening to people like General Van Herc, the commander of Northern Command, NORAD, and others, um, is basically the United States uh, sort of somehow uh, gleaned uh, a little while ago or some time ago that there were objects that were coming into our, our territorial airspace or surroundings um, that were potentially uh malign uh to use the term frequent frequently employed by the u.s government um you know intelligence and surveillance these kinds of things and so and then we we determined that we had missed some of them so so the three um balloon transits that the administration has has indicated happened under under the trump administration my understanding is that we did not determine that that had happened until afterward um and you know also the transit was it seems like it was much more modest so the 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 balloon that, that came over uh, you know, a week and a half or so ago, 
that was a much more significant one. What we've done is we've basically um, made our sensors, as far as I can tell, much more sensitive, so much more likely to pick up uh, a wider range, or I should say kind of a smaller items or slower moving items, if you will. And of course, that's radar, um, that's overhead reconnaissance, that may be, um, that may be other sensors. And you know, with the the big data and AI, we can process in a, a much more information than we used to. So a traditional challenge for the intelligence gathering enterprise has always been uh, the exploitation of information that's clean, because if you have to do it by hand or eye, there's stark limitations. And now with computers, we can do in, in big data, AI, et cetera, we can do a lot more. So I think as of now, we don't know what those three objects were. The American government says it, it does not know. Two of them are in the Ar- near the Arctic Circle. One is in Lake Huron, which is a very large Great Lake. So the, the, the administration has said they're benign. Um, they, they seem to have think they have evidence for that. We'll have to wait and see. But that's where things stand right now. You talk about the Chinese surveillance balloon. I mean, is this something that we're going to see more of, do you think, in the future um, in terms of sort of China testing, seeing what is possible to sort of get away with? A, a bit like we've seen in the UK, you know, in a different context, Russian, Russian jets entering British airspace to kind of sort of test resolve, etc. Do you think we're going to see more of these kind of surveillance balloons as, a, as an issue uh, in the future and learning how to sort of live with them and cope with them and deal with them as um, threats? Well, almost certainly. I mean, one point is that they have been uh, transiting. I mean, uh, Japan, uh, the Philippines, um, certainly Taiwan itself, but other uh, India, uh, U.S. government has indicated that the Chinese have used balloons in all of those locations and possibly more. There was another Chinese surveillance balloon that was operating over Central America. So uh, absolutely no question. uh, I mean, nothing is certain in this world, but as certain as we can be, there's a very large Chinese surveillance and intelligence gathering program and a very increasingly global Chinese military, they're looking at basing, I mean, even in Equatorial Guinea on the Atlantic coast of Africa uh, a year or so ago, not to mention the Middle East, East Africa, the Indian Ocean, South Pacific, Chinese uh, fishing vessels, which are pretty large when they're, especially when they're guarded by maritime militia, were operating aggressively off the Galapagos recently. So I think without question, we're going to all be feeling uh, the, the sort of pressure from uh, greater Chinese intelligence and ultimately military operations going forward. And Andrew, I mean, I wanted to sort of tease out this out as a question, really. I mean, what is the kind of relationship between UFOs and discussions and sort of sightings around that um, in terms of a sort of military context? I'm thinking about the sort of space race of the, the 1950s and 60s, really. Um, how, what is the relationship like between um, unidentified flying objects and the relationship with what's going on in a military context as well? Uh, I, 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 think, I think it's fairly close. Uh, I mean, you, in a way, you can see... The UFO, um, at least main. This sounds. This is a really weird phrase to use, but mainstream UFO community uh, is 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 clearly reflects uh, what is what 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 is going on in the outside world, and that clearly has in the past, and I think uh, currently actually has included defense issues. I mean, if you look at uh, the the you know the first great flap. Uh, which really lasted throughout the rest of the 1940s. And there was one over Washington uh, in as late as 51, 52, uh, and, you know, which, which worried even um, Harry Truman. Um, the, 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 I think they were a, firstly, there was an awareness that danger could come from overhead. The V2s had made that point. And then, uh, as they looked at the, the increasing Soviet threat, particularly after, uh, as, especially as it got nuclear and so on, there was an unease and attention, and that I think partly found expression through uh, through, 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 through 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 UFOs. Uh, were that were they were they looking at um, the Russians or were they looking at uh, something from elsewhere? And indeed, the um, CIA, and this again makes one sound like a conspiracy theorist. Uh, it was it was very interesting that the the origin the, the the initially the the U.S. government military slash military authorities um, uh, wanted to damp down talk with UFOs. There was the magnificently named uh, Project Grudge, uh, which 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 was designed to basically debunk it because they thought they were bad for morale. Um, but then later on. And I don't know the exact dates at all, whether it was the 60s or the 70s, uh, but 
people, when a lot of those very advanced spy planes, uh, the blackbirds of this world, uh, were, were, were flying around, uh, pilots would see them and the CIA would use all sorts of explanations, I believe, including UFOs to or hinting at UFOs to take away attention from the fact that this was, in fact, uh, American advanced weaponry being being tried. And, you know, let's not talk about Area 51, but you can go into all sorts of discussions as to that's quite useful disinformation. Flash forward uh, to um, today um, and... Uh, well, if you go to the 90s, there there you had paranoia, but, but that wasn't really so much to do with defense, uh, and the X-Files and all that. But if you flash forward to today, we are clearly in the middle of a UFO flap, which is directly uh, related to what the Chinese um, have been doing. Because as, as, a, as, as someone fascinated by UFOs, but a lifelong skeptic, uh, I, I saw some of these images of the so-called Tic Tacs, uh, which are these little white things that, that, that have been uh, photographed uh, by pilots. I heard what the pilots had to say. It was very much in the news over here. And um, that really has given a, a, a fresh impetus to classic UFO sighting. This wasn't something spiritual. This was, here we are, here, here we have things that people are seeing, pilots who are always seen as extremely reliable. And it does seem now uh, there are still, I've seen people still saying there's questions about what was seen from the Nimitz in, I think, 2004. But a lot of the things that have been seen are in reality um, Chinese balloons or Chinese drones. Um, we, we, we shouldn't forget the drones, uh, as if I could. Uh, the, 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 a lot of the weird movements you might have seen in some of the reports or the or, or, or even some of the footage might be uh, drones, uh, Chinese drones, which have apparently been reported near American ships and so on. Well, fascinating discussion and one to keep an eye on. Uh, thank you very much, Elbridge. Thank you, Andrew. Now, Paper Dragons. Is Chinese science all it's cracked up to be? Discussing this topic are Cindy from The Spectator and Brian Appleyard, who writes for this week's magazine on why China might be a great imitator, but not necessarily a great innovator. Uh, Brian, explain to us your thesis in this week's magazine. I think China has had a lot of catching up to do, and um, because it, it actually didn't embrace science really until the early 20th century. Um, and even then it was a bit reluctant. I mean, uh, Deng Xiaoping said, thought is better than, uh, action is better than thought, which is not necessarily true in science. And perhaps that's what it is, I don't know. But the other thing is that they were a relatively poor country um, for a long time and didn't have the um, equipment. I mean, the, the Chinese um, military uh, power now is very much dependent on the fact that it's been made, it's made itself very rich. And um, so I think it's just a sort of drag effect. And they have had to rethink um, their um, philosophy of, of how things are done. And I think, war losses in the 19th century and so on uh, made them realize the West had something they didn't have and that was science really. Uh, Cindy, how uh, accurate is that as a reflection of China's development and intellectual thought and the kind of philosophy underpinning mm -hmm. a lot of the Chinese state and its role towards technology over the past hundred years or so? Yeah, I mean, Brian is right that we often forget that China was a very poor country until very, very recently. I mean, the way we talk about China now in the last few weeks, a spy balloon story makes it seem as if it's the next techno superpower. And it could well be, but as Brian says, we're not there yet. And if you look at China's recent history, you know, it was very much like uh, pre-opening up Japan in the sense that there were so many hundreds of years of just feudalism closing off the rest of the world, really not developing domestically and focusing more on the classical literature when you're, you're going for your exams or you're going for the bureaucracy, you're valued on how, man, how many Confucian rights you know rather than whether or not you can have some kind of enlightenment value of experimentation. So I think all of that contributed to a situation where by the end of the 19th century, China's technology just wasn't on a par with the West and that had very real geopolitical impact on China and the, its people. And so over the last hundred years, China has really looked into this idea of science saving the nation. And I think that's why that's made such huge strides. I mean, Brian is right that we're still very, very behind in China when it comes to science, but it's made really, really rapid strides there um, in, in the last hundred years. And 
I think it'll be interesting to see whether or not that speed continues in the next, let's say, 100 years and whether or not that means an overtaking by then. And this has been a real priority for President Xi as well. Yes, absolutely. So in 2015, he set out this industrial policy called Made in China 2025, which is basically uh, moving away from China as a toy factory of the world, a clothes factory of the world, into semiconductors, smartphones, uh, renewable energy, all of these things uh, that China is making headway in. Um, mixed success, for example, with semiconductors, it just doesn't do as well as Taiwan, a country with much less investment, a much smaller uh, scale. So they'll, they'll mix success there. But for Xi Jinping, it's very much a top priority as well. Um, but I think you know, the overriding message from Brian's piece, which is the hysteria that we sometimes have about Chinese tech, um, is sometimes misplaced. But also, that doesn't mean writing it off completely. Yeah, Brian, in the magazine, you write about the difficulty in trying to get an accurate sense of where China is and all of that. Obviously, you said that part of uh, you know, Xi's own success is if the reporting is taken at face value about some of the claims about Chinese military prowess. Um, there's obviously difficulties in reporting on China and sort of what's been going on and sort of the extent of their innovation there. I, I just wondered, um, you know, how can we best get an accurate sense of where China is via America and the West at the moment? Um, <laughs> short answer is I don't know, because um, the problem is there's a sort of desperation about China at the moment, which is producing horrific um, um, uh, abuses of science. I mean, there was that the man who um, produced um, gene-edited babies, but, you know, suddenly out of the blue. He did it, he did it, he achieved it. Uh, what, whether, what the effect on, the, on those babies will be is unknown. But he was, he was thrown into prison because the Chinese realised this was an embarrassment to them. I mean, it was against the law what he did, but it, they realised it was against the international law as well. And it was an embarrassment to do it. Um, and and the, um, I noticed the, the, there's a Chinese um, fighter plane which looks remarkably like uh, the F-22 Raptor of the Americans. So there is a sense that they're imitating. And actually, it was the F-22 Raptor that shot down the balloon, ironically. Um, but um, I don't know that we can know. I mean, obviously, American intelligence will know so much that you know we don't know, so it's impossible to tell. But there is this sense in which things like the quantum computer claim made in, in China, which everybody else in the world has said is, is just outrageously wrong, um, which is lucky because I didn't want my bank account cleaned out tomorrow, which it could have done if it worked. Um, uh, then, um, you know, it, it's noise. It's noise. So it makes it difficult to know what's true and what's not. Um, and, and I mean, Cindy, I mean, this whole point about, you know, China being, you know, an imitator rather than an innovator. I mean, this is sort of classic what we see with every sort of great power mm. over the years, you know, over the centuries, you know, they all try and learn from each other. Mm. Um, I, I just wonder, is that a sort of, is that changing at all in recent years, post-COVID, um, in terms of what China's trying to do? Obviously, you mentioned the strategy earlier, um, but is this something that's both similar in military spheres as well as civilian, or is it sort of particularly focused on one area at all? Well, I think one interesting thing about the Russian invasion is how much it exposed the Russian army as being actually quite um, derelict and out of date, and possibly, you know, open question over how good the Western armies are as well. But, you know, I think for China, actually, in the military sense, there is a lot of stuff that is from Soviet legacy as well. And I think that if they were to invade Taiwan, we would see how much of that um, is similar to the Russian army when it comes to being paper tigers. Um, and then when it comes to, you know, what Brian's point about bigging themselves up, if I may, you know, the social credit scheme, something that is talked about so often in the West and used as a bogeyman so often as well, is actually one of those instances too where Chinese PR was much more um, dramatic and fun and exciting about it, this kind of notion of a black mirror school, but it actually doesn't exist like that in China at all. I mean, it exists in a completely different way that you wouldn't even recognise it. There is no single school that Chinese people live by that's dealt with by facial recognition, all of this stuff. A lot of it is advertising from often local governments or just government sources to make themselves look like they're very technologically advanced. Uh, and we do ourselves a disservice when we kind of buy into that uh, and then make policy based on that, which in the last few years we have done. Uh, Ron, one of the points you try to stress in the piece is that one of the few areas, perhaps the only area in which there's bipartisan cooperation on in Washington between Republicans and Democrats is this need to sort of curb the rise of China and counter that. Uh, do you think that with these points about sort of China trying to sort of overtake America in various spheres, this is going to be a real priority for America and thus the West in the years to come. And what really more can be done to curb these kind of behaviours? Well, 
Um, I think um, it's difficult to tell because I mean China's response is always say no, it's not a like, like it's not a it's a weather balloon or you know we didn't do it, Americans did it, and so on. Which so it's, it's like like with Putin, you, there's this, all this noise of con, uh, statement and denial. Um, I think we have to think. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that we have to think this way because there's no reason. To, to mourn the fact that China has become a rich, successful country on the face of it. It's just that we, they have decided, um, well, I'm sure we've all decided, that they are they are the enemy of the West and they, they resent the West, just as uh, Putin does. Um, now, you can't unpick that. So once, you know, one breach of the, of the deal and everybody goes back into overdrive, which is what's happening now. Um, so... I, how you would do that, I don't know. I mean, there may be a common cause that we could unite around, um, which everybody assumes is, is the environment, but I don't think that's going to happen somehow. It's, I mean, China's not really interested. It's, built, it's digging coal mines and so on. So um, I don't know. I think um, I think that there's something worth saying on top of that, which is just after I wrote this piece, I was speaking to a scientist, and he's, he said, the thing about Chinese science is that you can look at certain areas like astronomy, where they're really good, I mean, you know, in the, the, among the best in the world, and the, these these are non-military things. I mean, space may be a military thing, but it's not necessarily. And um, astronomy is certainly a very important area, very um, a very uh, well um, well financed area in China. Now, I think that's wonderful to hear. I mean, I'm delighted if Chinese do very good astronomy because you know I love hearing about astronomy, but um, whether, um, it, so that, that's just to say that Chinese science, pure science is brilliant. We know that. Um, it may be brilliant on the way to the quantum computers, which is net, potentially a weapon, let's face it. And uh, But, you know, it could be a weapon if America got there first. But um, I, it, it's just sad that we have to talk about this as sort of having replaced one um, gargantuan enemy in Russia, um, we're now replacing with China, which just strikes me as sad, and it's the human condition, really, isn't it? Cindy, one of the points that Brian makes in the piece is about um, the COVID vaccines, which China tried to develop. Mm. Has that kind of taken an effect on China's own self-esteem about the image about China as an innovator, a great science superpower on all these issues, or has it not made any effect whatsoever? No, I think it definitely has, actually. And I think that's one of the reasons that the party took so long to overturn zero COVID, because, you know, part of Made in China 2025 is to be good at life sciences, and that means vaccines. And when the biggest pandemic the world has ever seen in over 100 years comes along, you can't create your good vac your domestic vaccines that are as good as the Western ones. Well, that is a slap in the face to people in Beijing. Um, I'm not sure your average Chinese person thinks about it in such nationalistic ways, but they have been made to suffer the consequences of that embarrassment at the top because they were made to go through lockdowns instead of uh, mass vaccinations or, or mass vaccinations of mRNA vac vaccines, which China doesn't yet have. Um, and so I think all of that kind of just shows the leadership, oh, actually, we're not as good at science as we thought we were. Um, we still have to be a bit more, you know, working harder with that. But I think that actually leads to a lot of defensiveness in this current iteration of the Chinese Communist Party, where, where they're lashing out. The wolf warrior thing is coming out because they think that the, the zero COVID thing will stay for so long because they think we have to defend ourselves against accusations that we're not as good at science. Well, actually, it just makes it look even more embarrassing in the long run. Well, that's what I was going to ask you for my next question was going to be, you know, are there going to be concrete steps that we can see being taken already to try to sort of close that gap? You know, America, I remember, obviously, in the 50s and 60s, they referred to the, the missile gap, and, and mm. there was a sort of way of trying to make that about... Um, more militaristic element or is this still the regime in China still lashing out in defensiveness rather than kind of seriously sobering considering no, there, there is a lot of money going right. into science right now so in the last few years what we've seen is basically a clamp down on consumer technologies so for example things like Alibaba uh, Didi Shuxing which is the Chinese Uber all of these things in like a gig economy that had been thriving in the early 10, 2010s in China were clamped down on instead the government focused on more state-led technology. So we're talking about semiconductors, life sciences, as we've mentioned, renewables as well. Billions of dollars are going into these areas and semiconductors is the, going to be the hottest competition coming up because the Americans have done something called the CHIPS Act, which means that it's basically pressuring the world to choose between Chinese and American supply chains. 
And China doesn't want that because their semiconductors go into a lot of the different demands around the world. So at the moment, we have a very globalized supply chain about this. But the Americans are trying to decouple and force the Chinese out. And the Chinese are saying, well, you know, actually, we've got to be vital in this process. And so a lot of money is going to that. And I think it will be much like a Cold War era tech race. I, I, see, I hear what Brian's saying about how sad it is that we have to draw border, national borders in science, because, I mean, it's good for humanity for any of this development to be done. At the same time, I do wonder how much competition, geopolitical competition, does also drive scientific progress, as we saw in the Cold War. And Brian, I mean, a few years ago, I remember there was a sort of Civitas paper talking about the kind of technology um, that is feared that British academics were helping to develop in China, which could be used for military purposes. Um, there's obviously been talk about personnel as well. I just wonder what Britain's role in all of this is. Um, are we, frankly, you know, involved in this kind of discussions, uh, even as a minor player, or really will it just be set between America uh, and China, as we've seen with things like the CHIPS Act? Yeah, I think... Um... <laughs> I mean, there's another, there's another point, which is that whether we like it or not, the Chinese are already in our heads um, via TikTok and so on. And um, that and, and, and um, Huawei, I think um, it's, 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 they've got sort of uh, uh, di uh, dimensions of observation on us. And uh, God knows what how much TikTok uh, sucks up. Um, so I think I think we are. <laughs> I mean, there was a big row about Huawei and the um, the five G system, and we turned against them. But you see, this is going to be these are going to be rows that shouldn't be there, because um, the, why were I mean, if China didn't think in terms of uh, using Huawei as a spy system, as they probably do TikTok, if they didn't think like that, it wouldn't matter that we shared these things, and it would be better for all of us. But you know, I'm being ludicrously simple minded there. Um, but I think um, the British have in certain areas that some of the best science in the world and the chinese know this um as i said astronomy which we're also very good at um so if it is you know i think we will be sucked into a chinese com a chinese competition in good areas and bad um and um we've got to see our way through that <laughs> i'm not you know i can't tell you what the british are going to do i don't know i wouldn't couldn't imagine um about the British scientists working in China, and doubtless British scientists working in China do put, get put under. Um, Brian, I just want to challenge that view a, a little bit, the, the fact that, that it's the Chinese thinking about technology as a kind of national weapon that's leading us to this situation. I think the Americans absolutely do that too, and that's the way they have maintained their superpower status throughout the last few decades. You know, I mean, when, when it comes to Huawei, we already now have insider accounts that it was very much the American State Department that was pressurizing the UK into cutting Huawei out of our systems uh, at a time when there was actually no explicit evidence that Huawei was being used used as a spy system. So I just think, you know, geopolitics is, is as you say, it's is not simple. Uh, but I also don't think that when, when, when we're in this bipolar era that, you know, I guess it, and what I'm saying is that it takes two to tango. That's not a challenge. It's, I'm 50-50. I mean, you know, of course, America's doing those things. Um, I happen to prefer to live in the West than in China. So I'll just say, you know, China's doing those things. I'm on the side of, of the West. But it, I know America's doing those things. And some of them are probably awful. But, you know, I was, I was only talking about China. Well, thank you, Brian, for a fantastic piece in this week's magazine. And uh, thank you, Cindy, for joining us as well. And lastly, Kate Andrews writes for this week's magazine about the toxic cult of self-love. Kate, welcome to the programme. Hi, what James. Is, what exactly is the toxic cult of self-love? Um, well, it's perhaps more an observation than an official title. I don't think anybody practicing what I write about this week would label themselves in the toxic cult of self-love. Um, but... I've noticed that I think in a reasonable backlash to say the body shaming and the stigmatization of mental health in the decades past, there has been now perhaps an overcorrection in the way that we view self-love. Um, rather than just focusing on it and being kinder to ourselves and more forgiving of ourselves, there does seem to be quite a lot of people out there, a lot of individuals, a lot of corporates, a lot of messaging that now it's all about you. Um, and actually, if you start just seeking out ways to be a bit nicer to yourself, you can easily become quite exhausted. Um, you have to love yourself, apparently, all the time, without fail, no excuses, no questions. Um, and I write this week that I actually think that that kind of self-focus, not only is it a bit narcissistic, but it can really just drive you to misery.
And to do research this piece, you undertook uh, a fair amount of your own sort of investigative journalism, looking at a lot of TikTok accounts. What did you come across when you were studying all of those? That's a really kind way to talk about me just wasting time on TikTok, because <laughs> I would love to pretend that I was seeking this out, but actually I just found it, which is kind of what inspired the piece. But um, I was most struck by the 5 a.m. risers, and I described them as usually women um, across age spans. They might be at university right now. They might be millennial women, sort of the girl boss type. They might be mothers with multiple kids um, who are waking up at 5 a.m., although as I discovered in some cases, they're pushing it back to 4 a.m., even 3 a.m., to basically have a day before they have their day. Um, and I suppose it's just coming late to the 5 a.m. club, but they've turned the 5 a.m. club into a very extreme activity. So it's not that you exercise for 20 minutes, it's that you get your 90 minute workout in. It's not that you have breakfast, it's that you have, you drink your greens and you eat your pre-made breakfast that you prepped on the Sunday. And they spend hours and, and doing all this and all of it's supposed to be in the name of self-love. Um, and, you know, I, I find that exhausting. I'm tired enough when I have jet lag and I'm up at 5 a.m., um, let alone thinking that you just have to have, it's about consistency. It's like this pure consistency. And I wonder if some of this is displacing anxious behavior, anxious feeling into something that they can rebrand as healthy. But again, I think a lot of it is, you know, actually people are looking for these answers. Sometimes it doesn't feel like there's a lot of love in the world. Self-love is really hard. Um, and yet they're coming up with these routines almost as a replacement for like accepting their flaws. And I, I don't know, I, I'm not convinced by it. Yes, I was wondering if that self-love is just merely displacement activity, sort of searching for something else rather than, you know, in a quite hollow existence, perhaps. Is that the case you're sort of finding is that it's often people, you know, maybe younger people? And how, how much of an extent is this a female phenomenon as well? I mean, I notice primarily women, but then I have to note that the algorithm is probably showing me that content, um, thinking that I'm a woman in my early 30s and maybe I'd like to do this too. And like, for the record, I don't. I actually talk about how in the piece I, I did try some of the affirmations that you're supposed to do. So you're, How'd you find those? Well, you're supposed to take like a good chunk of time in the morning and stand in front of a mirror and say things like, you are beautiful, you are great, you are savage. <laughs> and I, I actually, you know, I'm being a bit unfair. I don't wanna completely slate that because I've been told by people this is really working for me. And as I say in the piece, like I couldn't get the words out. I physically recoiled doing it. And if it's working for other people, maybe, you know, I'm not trying hard enough. Um, if it's working for people, who am I to tear that down? No, really, you know, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be too flippant about it, but I, I found it really difficult. I didn't really, um, equate that with, with real self-love. And the questions that brought to my mind were like, you know, when you leave your day within a day, you know, when you go out into the world and you actually face its hardships and the hurdles and the miseries and all of that, are you really better prepared? Because you've you've done all of these things that our culture is now telling you equate to self-love. And, and I'm not so convinced. I mean, I, I think a lot of self-love comes from resilience, comes from, you know, people making you question yourself, doubt yourself, and actually that gut instinct of pushing back, like, no, I, I have something to say, or I have something to prove, or I have worth. Um, and you know, the, the way that we're turning that into now this like very extreme routine and it's everywhere, James, like it's in my coffee shop, love yourself on the wall. It's in my spin classes, which I adore, but it's, you know, self-care Sundays. And, um, is any of this really self-love or is it just our so, sort of the latest way we're trying to make ourselves feel a bit better? because there are like genuine difficulties around us. Yeah, you mentioned their adversity. I think from what you're saying, it sounds as if like you can't have self-love in a vacuum, that actually it's important to sort of be based on something, maybe substantive like achievement of some kind or having overcome something as well. Is there perhaps sort of a vacuumness at the, start, at, the, at the heart of all of this, which is something you presumably seem to recoil from the very notion of? You know, James, I think that's really possible, but I'm not really sure where self-love starts. And, and I write in the piece, I. I suspect I'm one of the many people out there kind of looking for those answers. Um, you know, I'm looking for ways to be kinder to myself. I'm, I'm not convinced you have to have a big achievement or something that society would say, yes, this is objectively good in, in order to have it. I think it's probably um, much more personal than that. And actually that's what's so ironic about this cult of toxic self-love is that it feels like you're constantly trying to prove how good, how pure you are, you know, how consistent you are. Um, and I don't know, my suspicion is that has very little to do with it. And 
again, I don't want to be too negative. I note in the piece, like regular exercise has been proven mm -hmm. to improve your mental health. You know, reading, writing, it's so great for the soul. It's not that I think in and of themselves, these are bad things. Um, but there's this real attempt now um, to, again, push back on perhaps what was like brutal judgment in the past. But that overcorrection is just like overwhelming levels of self-care being understood as self-love. And uh, I suspect that practicing them the way that a lot of people are practicing this is not actually leading to pure happiness. Mm. And is it sustainable long term? I mean, how many of these people start these routines? They may begin trying to journal every day or so, but you know, is this something that sort of fizzled out after six months, a year or so? And also when you do encounter some of those adversities of life, you know, having children, for instance, maybe working a different job with different hours, actually some of those routines really can't sort of stand the test of time, as it were. Well, this is it. You, you have to cut out all human messiness in order to live that way. If you have a child or a friend in need or basically anyone in your life who might change your routine, um, you know, after 9 p.m., say if someone invites you for dinner or there's, a, you know, any social event going on, this would be a really tough way to live. And, and I do kind of note that, that, um, you know, there's something really wonderful about being taken in a different direction, even, you know, for an hour or two throughout your day. Um, and I would really struggle with the rigidness that this kind of self-love is demanding. Um, and you said about culture earlier, is this something that's sort of British or American or is it just sort of worldwide? Is this sort of regardless of borders, as it were, a cultural trend? Well, Look, I think it's something think it's... you're seeing in, in countries like the US and the UK and certainly countries where social media is prevalent. I don't think it's only Western. But you also have to wonder, like, what kind of lifestyle and, and what level of prosperity you have if you are able to do some of these things. Um, you know, I, I suspect that actually a lot of people posting may not have your classic nine to five job that demand on their income, or, you know, it, it might actually be what, what TikTok is, you know, they might be getting money from something like that. Um, but it strikes me that this concept of a day before a day, I would really like to know what's happening during the normal waking hours for most people, for those people. Are they napping? Let's be honest here. Like, are they in that like ruling job that's demanding so much of them? Because I wouldn't have like a 10th of the enthusiasm or effort that they have when they get up at 5 a.m. Um, I, I really wonder where that comes from. Yeah, I wanted to ask, you said you tried this and physically recoiled from saying some of the words you're supposed to. How many days do you try to live like this? Um... Well, existence. Um, James, the affirmations only made it two days. And I, <laughs> I really was like, I'm going to end up disliking myself if this process continues. I've definitely gone through phases where, you know, I've tried to, you know, wake up in the morning and, and, and live this like very meditative lifestyle. Um, for me, it's not so successful. But, you know, again, for others, if it's working for you, just please don't pretend it's easy. Please don't pretend that finding self-love is easy and don't pretend that it's so simple as creating a routine. Well, let me end by uh, affirming you and saying thank you very much for coming on and delivering us a wonderful talk. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and see you next week.